Howdy again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher. Welcome back to my humble abode. Now, the subject of this uh, video is repairing a little Sterrett antique indicator. Not a dial indicator, it's a test indicator. And uh, you might recall in a recent video where I bought this, and uh, I have several of them, of course I've got several of everything, so this might be a feeble attempt, <laughs> and if it is, of course, you won't see the video, but let's take a closer look. You know what? Even though I've made thousands and thousands of references to steroid tools in my videos over a 15-year period, they have never given me anything or uh, contacted me, but so be it. It's still a great company, and uh, I am undaunted. This is October 2023, and I hope that most of you have watched this very recent video of mine about a great auction where I bought a lot of stuff. And among the, the tools that I bought at that auction is a Sterrett back plunger indicator. But in the box was this little Sterrett indicator. And notice that I marked it in red. And there was another part here. I already took that off. But this indicator does not work properly anyway. As you can see, there's something wrong with it. So I'm going to attempt to repair it. And I don't know why, because I have two of these, and the other one works perfectly. But I'm using this as a comparison, so I can try to determine what is wrong when I take the covers off. Now these are nice little indicators although I seldom use them, and they have a very small range of just about four or five thousandths on either side of the center. There's a patent number in here, so I will show you patent drawings, but those indicators have disappeared out of their catalog, and now I'm sure have been replaced by the more popular and wonderful little last word indicator and other companies make similar types of test indicators that are just absolutely wonderful so let me show you a couple pictures in an older 1990 Sterrett catalog where they still show this rather primitive item although this was patented in the 30s I would have thought 1830 or 1910 or something, but it, it's much more recent than that, and uh, I'll show you the catalog right now. Okay, there's the patent, and it's 1934, just before the Second World War. That was during the Depression, by the way, and I wonder what the price was. And this is from the 1990 catalog, and notice that it says right here, and they call it a junior. I wonder if there was a senior, but it has a range of only ten thousandths from one end to the other. That's five thousandths, as I already said, on either side of zero. And there is the ubiquitous last word dial indicator on the previous page of the same catalog. And you know, I particularly love this catalog because it's spiral bound and will stay open and lay flat. And I think they only did that for a few years. Many other companies made small non-dial test indicators such as this one that has a push on it and I've shown that in other videos and th this particular one here is very popular matter of fact I believe I have three of them in fact it is such a nice little uh, device that it really is ideal for all of your indicator needs Okay, here's the game plan. I have both Sterrett indicators mounted in Sterrett vices, no less, so that I can work on them and photograph them, for that matter. And if you look at uh, a little bit of a close-up view here, the bottom one is marked in red, and that is the one I'm going to work on, but I'm going to take the cover off of both of them so that it can, can, can compare them, because as you can see, this one doesn't work, although I can bring the little needle around. I suspect it has a broken spring of some kind, but this is how it should work. So I'll take both covers off, 
very carefully now I've already removed the nuts and I keep everything in a little magnetic tray because if I lose one of these little screws I will just throw it away. Okay with both covers removed we'll have a close-up here. Top one again is the good one. Gives you a little idea how it works or doesn't work. And upon examining it a little closer off camera, it appears that the bottom one has a broken spring. Let me zoom in again and do the same thing, only a little bit closer. If you like this kind of video, let me know in the comments and give me a thumbs up. It's very difficult to do because of my eyesight. And by the way, I do go to the eye doctor in four days for new glasses. So this again is the good one. Now take a look at this little spring tiny little spring and it starts way over here and it wraps around that screw and goes here and it's clipped onto the hand. Now for the bad one. So this being the bad one you can see that there is no spring around the hand. So I believe the spring is broken. So I'm going to see if I have any spring stock here that might be suitable to use so I can make the spring which will be no easy job because there are many bends even right here you can see where there's a little bend to uh, have this uh, the screw so because the screw interfered is what I meant to say sometimes my tongue gets tangled could it be because I'm 80 Using my calipers, I was able to sneak in there and measure the thickness of that wire and it's only nine or ten thousandths. Well, at the same auction last week when I bought these, this, uh, remember I got this little tube of wire and I thought, well, that'll be ideal. But in fact, it's much larger. It is, I don't know about much, it's it's about 18 thousandths almost and it appears to be springy but yet it's easily kinked so that would not be suitable so I looked through my vast selection of springs and I had two tubes here of round spring wire and I believe it's from Brownells but the very smallest in there also is about and this is very springy it truly is spring steel but this is about 20,000 so it maybe it would work but it would be too stiff so I am a little I, you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna take that spring out and uh, if I can and see what the deal is and what I need to do or should I give up well you can see here that there, this Mr. Gisson who patented this in 1930 he filed in 32 it wasn't approved until 34 these things take a long time because you know the government doesn't move very fast except when they want to spend huge amounts of many money then they can do it overnight if they can agree on anything you know they're totally insane but what I was going to say uh, in this drawing here is that quite often the patent drawings aren't exactly a light uh, like the finished product so you can see here that the the way the spring is made is really quite different so they probably made up some like this and said that doesn't work so let's do this and they change it slightly but the patent is still in effect and if I showed you the entire documentation for this patent you will see that it is assigned to LS Sterrett company I am so thankful that I have these and a loop and tweezers and all kinds of fine instruments that uh, will aid me in this and even a jeweler you know, uses all of this kind of stuff so even young men well, I don't think there are any young jewelers are there they're all old men like me I've noticed alright let's delve a little bit deeper into this without totally taking it apart okay upon closer examination here you know what I see? The spring is not broken. It has slipped off. There's a little loop up at the top, if you can see that, and the spring has slipped off of the needle because you can see now the needle is free to fall by gravity. Okay, now my scriber is magnetized, as you can see. I'm wondering if I can lift that little... Yes! 
Did you see it go back on? Now we got to take the magnet off or everything will be screwed up. Uh, see how the needle bounces back now? Not by gravity. You know, often I'm looking at my monitor over there, which enlarges it for me even more than what it is now. All right, that being done, maybe the video is over. Let's see if it works. So we'll get out here to the end. No, look, it's sluggish. It's very sluggish. It's not returning. So, you know, there's multiple problems here. The spring is fixed, but it's not returning. So it appears that we got a problem either right here on that pivot point, although there shouldn't be because there's a tiny brass sleeve there, so there should be no corrosion. But this looks kind of rusty right here, but is the real problem possibly the little plunger here that is actuated by the tip? So I'm going to start here by using genuine steric oil, and some of you are probably going to say that's still way too thick. You need instrument oil. Well, it says instrument, so this is the thing. So I'm going to put a little oil on the two pivot points and try to get it drawn in to the uh, the pin or whatever it is. Let's take a, a look at the patent drawing again to see if it shows anything in that regard. By the way, what I showed you about the, the spring wire and all that was a complete waste. I should cut that out, but since I filmed it, you're going to watch it anyway. Or you have watched it, actually. So here are two views, a front view and a side view of what's going on in here. And again, I'm not totally positive that the final product is built this way because they do make changes. But you can see what appears to be uh, also a little spring here before it goes into this section here where there's a little pin. But I have a feeling that there's a little corrosion or stickiness in this area. So that's what I want to oil. So give me a few minutes and I'll be back and we'll see if that works. Praise the Lord. It works. And I oiled this one too, by the way. And again, I used this. Leroy Sterrett would be proud of me. Okay, I'm going to button them back up if I can do so without... Uh-oh. What's that? You know, I was only able to get oil. I, I oiled it right here. Whether or not any oil got into the shaft here, I don't know. And I don't know if it comes apart with that tiny little screw or if that is used just to ro rotate the snout on here and the, and the probe by 90 degrees. Let me work it a little bit, see if I can work the oil in, and I'll be right back. You know what? To get at that tiny screw, I had to get out this thing, the optivizer, a little magnifier, and trifocals. I still can't see it. I take back some of the things I said. Sorry, Sterrett, but I used a little liquid wrench, which is far thinner, and immediately it loosened up and works perfectly. Let me zoom. First of all, take note that the probe here, and that's the purpose of the little neural there, is you can rotate this to any angle you want. For instance, there at 90 degrees. Now that's the good one. Well, both good now. Now? Okay, the top one the works fine. It did before I started. Now here's the one that I fixed. Let me get that out of the way. Works perfectly in both directions. Now I truly will button them up. You know what? My hands are fairly steady and shake free for an 80 year old. What do you think? 
I'm pretty happy, although you know what? I bet if I would take have taken some of this, well, the spring had to be fixed, didn't it? But other than that, I bet if I had thrown this in a pan of liquid wrench, it would have worked just fine without all of that tedium. Because in general, I don't like to work on real tiny things. You probably don't either. Well, now that I'm an expert at repairing indicators, I've got my work set out for me. Not. Hey, these will probably be on Pete Bay for those of you that are smarter than I am. Well, as usual, I turned a two-minute video into a 20-minute video. I hope you stuck with me, but story time here before I quit. You know, I'm always talking about West Clocks because that was a big deal when I was a kid and I met my wife there, or that's where she worked, I should say, and I've shown you some pictures of the buildings and that and talked endlessly about West Clocks. Well, so what? Well, about five years ago, we went to an event and it was in the old West Clocks building because now there are many, many other little businesses in there and it was a, it was a musical event with a uh, violin. I love a violin. But anyway, there were other old people. They were all old. It goes to, they go to events like that. But uh, so I met a friend of mine there, Archie, and uh, his wife died, so he's with a new woman. Uh, I don't know if they married or not. Uh, nobody bothers with marriage anymore. But I got to talking to this old lady. Well, she was about 85. Now I'm 80. But she said, yeah, I used to work at Westlocks for about for 40 years. And I said, oh, really? What, what did you do? And she said, oh, I put hair springs into the watches through a microscope, one of those shop microscopes. And I said, oh, you must have hated that. And she said, oh no, I loved it. I loved working there. We had such great camaraderie with all the other girls around me. So my mind doesn't always think the way other people think. I, I just think, you know, that'd be a horrible job. No, she loved it. And uh, I'm so glad she did because we need people like that. And you know, at West Clocks, probably three-fourths of the workforce was uh, girls and women because they are patient, they have great eyesight when they're young, they're steady, and they're dependable. And many of those women, of course, were girls, the radium girls. Remember I talked about the radium girls? A lot of those, that work was outsourced into Ottawa, Illinois, and I've even taken you to that site. But in our newspaper the other day, they are still working on the radium cleanup you know, when are they ever going to finish that? And they have allocated another $50 million for the cleanup. And they've already spent almost $100 million. And uh, for what purpose? I don't know. Because they have an area, you know, that is fenced off. And what they want to do is spend uh, this 50 or $60 million and, and essentially get all the contamination out of there. And it probably goes way, way down. And guess what? You people out in Wyoming and Nevada and Utah, that radium is coming your way. And isn't that unfair? Yeah, it's shocking. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video and I, you know, I ended up with one of my rants, didn't I? Yeah, I'm slipping. But, but anyway, stick around for just a little clip of extra credit here and then a bunch of still pictures, including some of those uh, uh, patents or, or the patent drawings which, with close up. So I hope you enjoy that. This is Mr. Pete saying so long, and I'll see you next time. Much, much more to come. This is extra credit. I hope someone is still watching. Okay, in my bench centers now, I have mounted a three-quarter lathe mandrel. Boy, they marked that nice, didn't they? Now, remember, a lathe mandrel is tapered. So this is the large end marked plus. So that's, that should be the biggest end. Now I'm going to find the high spot. Watch the needle now. I'm moving in closer than what you can see. So I'm pretty well on zero. And I can easily adjust it to zero with this knob on the surface gauge. Matter of fact, let's zoom in and watch that. I know I beat it to death, don't I? See what I'm doing? And I'll try to get it on zero.
All right, that looks pretty good. And I'm spinning it now. And it shouldn't move, should it? Now I'm going to move this down and find the high spot on the small end and we'll see how much difference there is. Well, why don't you just use a micrometer, some of you are thinking. And I agree, but I will bring that off and come on to this end. I think I'll zoom in for that. So you can see that there is what about four thousandths difference between the large end and the small end and now I'm spinning the mandrel and of course I could, if I wanted to I could set this back to zero on the so-called tailstock end. So I'm doing now something rather senseless, but perhaps you learn just a little bit. Now, for my next little, I'm never done, you know. I just took this piece of half inch cold roll and I centered rolled both ends just in a three jaw chuck. I do not expect this to be very accurate. So let's put it in the bench center and see. Of course this could be done on a lathe. Be right back. Okay, now the longer piece is in there and I was lucky, it just barely fits in there, so I'm at the extreme for this uh, set of bench centers. And let me zoom in now, because what I'm doing here is rotating it between centers to see how accurately I center drilled. And I have to find the high spot, and I did. And you know what, I'm within, I gotta get down there and look, within a thousandth. Actually that's pretty good. Let's see if the other end is better or worse. It could be different. And the whole point of this little demo here was to see how accurately I could drill the center holes and it was quite accurate. I did not think that it would be that close. I thought it would be four or five thousandths off and that a lot depends on how carefully you center drill, engage the drill, and how accurate your three jaw chuck is on the machine. Okay, I'm at the far right hand end of the centers. Let's zoom in. And you know what? It's about the same within a thousandth. Now I will spin it. Now of course that could be done with the last word indicator or just about any kind of indicator. In fact, but I trust this I could go one step farther and make the video longer and do the same thing with a last word or or a, a Telsa or you know Brown and Sharp, but I'm not going to do that because the video is over. But watch for some still pictures. So long again. Here's a little bonus footage of the workspace.